Trying to see where you see the live audience here, like who has joined or who is not. <laughs> I have it on Twitch and Twitter open. Okay. Uh, why, why don't we just wait um, yeah. uh, five or so minutes for people to funnel in, then we can start. Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. It should be a fun conversation. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from both of your views on tokenization and NFTs and DAO. You, Justin, since you've been in this space for so long, I'll pause on some of the slides that kind of makes, you know, and you can add in your experience. So that should be fun. Cool. Sounds good. Gonna go on mute for real quick net. Yeah, it looks like people are starting to funnel in. I'm seeing almost a hundred viewers here. Uh, we can we can wait a few more minutes. I'm also happy to give a five minute TED talk about something completely uh, tangential. Yeah, we should absolutely do that. Yeah, wh why don't you do that? <laughs> <laughs> maybe uh, maybe we can give short introductions for now as as people yeah. funnel in. Uh, and you know, I, I don't know if there's a section in the deck here, Rohan, about the recent uh, split with Horizon Labs into Horizon Labs Ventures. Uh, but you know, we, we can give some of that background too. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll just start and then I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Rohan. Um, cool. my name is Degentraland, also known as Matt. I am the metaverse strategy lead here at Horizon Labs Ventures. Been at the firm for about two months now. Uh, the position is mo mostly focused on, um, the other side as, as we build out our infrastructure uh, and our strategy around what to do with our land. So we're the third biggest uh, landholder after Yuga Labs and Animoca. And then the other part of my job is to support the tokenization and, and DAO structuring business. Fantastic. Justin. Hey, I'm Justin Calland. Um, I'm here at uh, with Horizon Labs Ventures as uh, um, focusing on product innovation. So um, building lovable products is my background of about 20 years. And now being able to apply that to Web3, to DAOs, to um, the NFT space we all love. Uh, super exciting and happy to be here. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm so excited to have these seller teammates on, on our side at Horizon Lab Ventures. Just a quick uh, intro on me, Rohan Honda. I'm the head of business development and strategy at Horizon Lab Ventures. Been with uh, the firm for a little over a year at this point and been, what, what a ride, right? Like we've gone from the launch of ApeCoin to other side, now today the Ape Staking platform and just continue to hone in and bring on like exciting projects within the space, working with gaming studios. Uh, and yeah, I know Matt, you touched briefly on the, you know, the spin out from Horizon Labs into Horizon Lab Ventures, where we are focusing so much so on the advisory building tech stack tools and uh, products that will help, you know, push the entire Web3 uh, space forward. I'm super excited to have uh, Magic Eden kind of being a collaboration partner in a lot of different uh, avenues here as well. And excited to be here and talk a bit more around tokenization and DAOs and also like how we at Horizon Lab Ventures partner with uh, the, the projects. So I'll, I'll go through a quick deep dive into what we have been up to who are our clients, what's our network, and maybe a quick case study here and there. So yeah, great to great to be here. Awesome. Right. I think I think we could probably jump into it. I'm seeing uh, about a hundred people on Twitter right now. Okay. A few more on Twitch. So I think uh, I think we can get started. Sweet. Um, I'll just lead us in and I'll have my amazing uh, teammates here kind of chime in and add color to things and, uh, you know, the conversations we have overall within the Web3 and the crypto space at large. Really, uh, you know, 
humbled to have this opportunity uh, to do this um, presentation alongside Magic Eden. So we are Horizon Lab Ventures. Um, and just very quickly going through an overview, where we are situated is we are an end-to-end -end advisory services provider. And what we do is we work with our projects and partners, providing them um, you know, white paper, tokenomic services, working through their legal uh, aspects, um, working, you know, helping Web2 companies figure out how to get into Web3, uh, figuring out what are the needs, what are the problems that they're trying to solve. And as you can see from some of the logos and the companies that we work with, we are in the business to find really innovative projects, right? Some of you uh, on this call may know, may know us from uh, our collaboration with the Yuga Labs and the Eight Point Drop, um, but that's not all, right? We're working with some of the other top innovative uh, projects in the space, like the Sandbox. We're working with Jam City, which is a AAA gaming studio, helping bring game fight to life in a unique uh, and entertaining way uh, that the broader blockchain gaming space misses. Um, we're working with some of the other metaverses like Vinkyverse. We've even gone into uh, you know, health tech uh, businesses, figuring out how crypto, how uh, fungible tokens and NFTs can play a part and provide new value add services that most of the businesses and projects within Web2 are not able to. Because as you realize, a lot of the um, the reason why Web3 and crypto came to life is because of the siloed services a lot of these projects provide. What Web3 enables is the interoperability, the openness of doing things to, together in collaboration with multiple different projects and bringing value uh, to the table, not just to one single entity, but in a more decentralized manner. Um, so our services you know, go all the way from NFTs to fungible token launches. We've added a lot more uh, firepower around our DAO implementation. As you heard, Decentraland here, who owns, uh, you know, tackles our metaverse strategy. Um, so all in all, we tackle it all, right? So we are, we are the team um, that you'd want to lean on uh, in, in this highly regulated, highly complicated space. And, and it would be wrong for me to say, or any of our team members to say here, um, that we do it all by ourselves, right? Powering this entire ecosystem is our partners, our network system that we really heavily uh, rely on. Because as you see, the whole goal here is to bring all the right players and partners together so that the projects, the token launches, the DAOs itself, and the community itself becomes uh, sustainable and long-term business viable. Right. So as you can see, we work with the top investors in the space, all the way from your Coinbase Ventures to DCG to Sound Ventures to A16Z. We bring them in their, you know, help some of the projects that we work with, provide them the right capital if and when they need it. Right. Not all projects are prime to receive capital because a lot of times we get into the conversation like, when do we bring in investors? Does all NFT projects actually need investment? A lot of times the answer is no. If you really enjoy just minting NFTs or just building community, you may not need it, right? Similarly is with exchanges. Do, do all projects need to launch to a centralized exchange or can these centralized ex exchanges can play the part? But regardless, we, uh, through our relationship, our understanding of this space, we help the projects kind of figure out, do the due diligence, understand what is it that a lot of these exchanges are looking for in order to, you know, provide the right support that the projects will need. So, you know, we help make those introductions, bring in, again, leveraging our network, right? Same thing goes with market makers. Market makers typically tend to provide that liquidity uh, and volume on day one. Having the right market makers on your side is very critical because they can help understand and provide additional feedbacks on the tokenomics model, how the allocation, how the emission of the tokens long term will potentially impact the price volatility, how it will impact the supply and demand for, for that ecosystem. So it's always good to have second, third pair of eyes, which you typically not get when you're doing all by yourself. Um, and last but not the least is the crypto natives, right? Which is the broader network of ecosystem where people, where projects are being built, whether it be with Animoca brands or with Magic Eden providing the launchpad platform for launching your NFTs um, or Cointelegraph, for instance, which 
acts as media partners for a lot of the projects uh, that we work with are looking more nuanced um, approach around finding the right uh, you know, layer one or layer two chains on which you should be launching your projects. So we have the right network in place that allows us to see things from a lot of different angles uh, and provide that orchestration um, that we, otherwise you'll be dependent upon very, uh, you know, very various number of individual entities and things may become more difficult than it actually should be. Um, so that's our superpower and that's what we bring to the table. So I see this, uh, yeah, and if you have any questions that Decentraland posted, do let us know, right? We wanna make sure this is conversational, this is value add to you, to things that you're working on, building, or just really interested in learning more about the space, we're here for you, so feel free to drop in any questions. Um, I just wanna to touch real quick on some of the services that we tend to provide, and you know, less about the services that we provide, but more for you as an audience to understand there are a lot of intricate details that goes into launching a successful project. As um, you know, our managing director, co-founder, I, I don't know if Dean's on the call or not, he would put it into kind of two categories. Um, uh, Dean Steinbeck is our managing director and co-founder. He would say there's two ways to launch it. Either you do a FOMO, uh, sorry, YOLO, which is you, know, you only live once. That's one way to go around launching a project or a token. Other, other way is taking you know, a little more detailed approach and figuring out, okay, what is it that we're really building towards? What's, is there a business at the end of the day? Are we building an ecosystem where the community can eventually thrive? Or are we just, as you call it, you know, minting for the sake of minting, but no idea how to scale this into a business? And not saying one of the two options is wrong or right, it just comes down to, uh, if you are thinking of launching a fungible token or a non-fungible token, you always want to have some sort of an exit plan or a long-term plan in position. And especially when it comes to fungible tokens, there is very uh, nuanced things you want to be thinking about, right? For instance, like what is the concept? What is the roadmap? What's the utility that fungible token will provide? What is, do you have a platform in place beyond just community and the number of followers on Twitter or on Discord that the users would be able to use your fungible token once it gets launched? Okay, if so, how do you think about the token economics? How do you design the ecosystem where people can use that token? Is it a circular economy? Is like what's going in also coming out or is it all just going in or all just going out, right? Because that will really puncture your entire uh, um, process all in all, right? So you want to be careful about that. So that's where we think through things from a quantitative as well as qualitative analysis. We do the market research, uh, understanding, designing the game mechanics, understanding the flows, the sinks and the faucets. For instance, if you're a gaming, game, gaming company, um, outlining the project's concept, what the economics look like, which could include like how many tokens, right? What should the allocation be? Who should be the contributors? How's the emission of that token happening? Is the number of tokens right or wrong? Is this an inflationary economy or a deflationary economy? All of those questions need to come across uh, in a systematic manner and we help uh, side by side, right? The goal here is not that we tell you what to do or we tell our partners or projects what to do, but the goal is to identify what are the possibilities and prioritize them so that you're able to make the right uh, decision based on that uh, filtered information. I'm going to pause here real quick and I want to get both, uh, you know, Matt and Justin's opinion in terms of like how they think about these first two points and how critical it is for any, uh, you know, uh, successful token launch or projects launch within Web3 space itself. Yeah, it seemed, you know, in the 2021 bull market, the meta was to get as much out as fast as possible. Uh, NFTs, token launches, DAOs, uh, just throw together something on Snapshot, release a 10K animal PFP project, and uh, I hope something comes together. Uh, now that we're in a bear market, and you know, practically speaking, if we're trying to build sustainable businesses five, 10 years down the road, 
you need to think five or 10 years ahead. Uh, so, you know, like Rohan said, you have to think about um, the different sinks or the use cases of your token. You have to think about DAO structuring. What stakeholders do you want to give more weight to than others? Do you want this to be fully decentralized at the start? Do you want it to start more centralized and become decentralized over time? There are so many considerations here, and there's not one blanket answer. It's going to vary partner to partner. So, you know, what's important for us to do at HLV and important for you to do if you're uh, thinking of launching your own project is to think about all of the nuances that your competitors aren't thinking about. Yeah, I agree with that full heartedly. Um, you know, thinking long-term business models that are community driven, um, especially the DAO component. I, I'm, a, I'm in love with DAOs. I think to me, Web3 is the human era of blockchains. And, you know, with, with blockchains, we got, you know, a decade to experiment with different consensus mechanisms. I'm really excited about bringing DAOs into that mix because DAOs to me is the human version of consensus. And, you know, a big part of why, one of the reasons I joined HLV and, and what really excites me about what we provide and who we choose to work with is that, you know, we're focused on long-term um, sustainable business models, not uh, FOMO driven uh, short term, uh, um, you know, pump and dumps. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's, that's really all I can add there, but yeah. yeah. No, I, I think that's important. And I think that leads us into the part where you want to, you know, bring in the right partners and integrations, right. Whether it be from the kind of institutional outreach you do, or like who are the right exchanges you want to be listing on, or who are the right market makers you want to be uh, partnering up with. Right, who are the right custodians of your assets more long term? So there's a lot of due diligence and a lot of work that needs to go in. I think one of the challenges that we see and one of the like big mistakes a lot of projects tend to do is they just want to move really fast. Um, and what 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 the outcome of moving really fast is you're not giving enough time to think through the challenges that you might see, not immediately, but say in a quarter's time or by the end of 12 months or 18 months. So you got to always think 12 to 18 months time frame how this project will eventually evolve because it's in this space, it's very easy to launch something. There's so many launch paths that allow you that flexibility and that opportunity to just launch a token. But then you eventually will run into issues like regulations or compliance or you know, some sort of a rug pull, I, you know, all, all of those are part of this mix and it's very hard to, um, you know, figure out which one are, which projects are legit, which is not. Typically, projects that are legitimate tend to spend a lot more time, have the right, uh, you know, thought process behind why they're launching what they're launching. They're the right, op there are right operators behind those projects who are thinking about the view of the community in a long term perspective and not just trying to, um, you know, get quick rich uh, mechanics behind that. So there's a lot, a lot of uh, constructive mechanics that goes behind it. And that's why we try to bring in the right partners from every different angle. And I think one of the questions that uh, comes up that by Crash8918 is like, how do you view? involvement of VCs and token launches. Um, yes, there are mismatched incentives um, and how do you model it? I think a lot of it really depends upon why you want to bring in VCs into your round to begin with, right? There are a few different ways you do it. One is where you bring in VC capital to hopefully bring in the right partners who will be essentially be strategic door openers for you. Right. So you want to bring in VCs, not just for the capital, but can they actually help you think through what's next for the company, for the community, for the network in itself? Right. You don't want to be bring in VCs for VCs sake. But the other model to that is you don't need anyone. You can do a fully decentralized launch, like a public uh, launch, right, where you let the community as a whole determine how the eventual DAO will function, right? Have more token allocation towards the community, uh, provide them incentive to really build it through and through. But the challenge again is there's nothing preventing or not, nothing propelling that community really to do much after a certain period of time if the incentives die out or the interest dies out or there's not enough right projects within the space that are keeping the steam going and that we have seen over and over again, right? What 
VCs or these experienced operators bring to the table is their understanding, not necessarily always from a Web3 or a crypto space, but just about building sustainable businesses and what are the challenges that you uncover as part of building a business. And that's the extreme value add that you have from bringing in these external money into the ecosystem. But I know, Justin, you you had some comments as you uh, raising a hand. So. Yeah, I was just going to add to that to, to Crash 8918's question there. Um, you know, I think um, you see a lot in the space where people blame VC money after a token fails. But, you know, the truth is VC money is a tool. Um, and just like any tool, it can be used to, to build a house or to hit somebody. Um, I think uh, in, in particular, what we see is if you have bad tokenomics, if your tokenomics suck and your model sucks to begin with, it doesn't matter how much VC money you bring in or how much money you don't bring in, your token's not going to work out. Right. And as Rohan said, um, bringing in the right, I think, partners, whether they're VCs, whether they're whether, you know, they're other communities, um, wherever it comes from, but partners that can actually help you execute and build, you know, a sustainable model that involves a token, uh, I think, is, is the real root issue, not necessarily um, the money itself. I think also Band-Aid solution here is vesting schedules. Uh, if a VC has to hold their tokens for two years, they're probably going to be more incentivized to help grow the ecosystem than if they can dump it on the first day. Uh, again, just like there, there are a ton of different components that go into a successful token launch. That's one of the many. Yeah, and that's exactly right. These are all components, right, of your successful token launch. And from our experience, these things should be done in a structured manner, right? You shouldn't be skipping to say, bringing in VC money before having the tokenomics, for instance, or thinking through what blockchain you want to launch, for instance. Yes, it's good to have that exercise done, but there is a method to this madness. And that method is thinking things through from the basic fundamental principles first, and then aligning the financial incentives with the VCs, institutions, and your own or the team, whatever the case may be. I think uh, that is part of, um, the core principles that's currently missing in Web3. And I, but I think with the recent uh, changes in, in the space itself, we'll start to seeing a lot more um, uh, approaches where people are thinking more from building products, building businesses, building things the right way, similar to what you're doing in Web2, but using crypto and Web3 uh, economics as a way to incentivize users and the community to continue building on it without any barriers in between. So I think that shift we will start to see uh, see a lot more. Um, and last but not the least, as, as I mentioned, right? So all of these pieces are good. So like concept, your tokenomics, your partnerships, your institutional outreach, the blockchain, smart contract development, that takes you up till um, your your token launch in itself right and that in itself is a lot of work one other piece that is very critical is thinking through how you set up that DAO, who manages the DAO, who's going to be the community of sort of special council members who will create the guardrails for your DAO. and i know justin has a ton of experience setting some of these DAOs up so would love to hear from him but the part here that's critical to know setting up a DAO, launching a token is just day one of your life cycle in your ecosystem or the token launch process. That is just seeding the idea that yes, community has control and they're excited about building something within uh, that framework. Now, how you excite the community, how do you incentivize users, that all becomes part of the DAO and how you write proposals, how you give them the playbook to write proposal. That is a very key element of how these, these things kind of sustain and thrive over a long period of time. But Justin, uh, you've been in a few DAOs, so uh, it would be great to hear how, how you've dealt with all of these. Yeah, I have uh, uh, definitely some background on DAOs. Um, you know, I think the important thing to remember is, you know, I've, I've been involved in very large DAOs from the beginning. Um, you know, I think the way I look at DAOs today is that the term DAO is just a set of tools. And there is no one size fits all for every every community, which I think is a rut we tend to get in in the Web3 space is we're like, oh, the right way to do a DAO is A, B, and C. But the truth is DAO is um, a very general term that can mean a lot of, of, of different mechanics and tools. And, you know, we might be working with a AAA gaming studio, helping them set up a DAO is going to be very different than working with, you know, um, a purely token DAO like ApeCoin DAO. 
um, there's going to be different mechanics that go into um, the consensus process. There's going to be different tools used, and there's going to be different ways to incentivize um, participation. Um, incentivizing participation uh, in a DAO should be a huge part of, of every project's vision and something that's really thought of from the beginning, because without that participation, the DAO isn't really much more than uh, a checkbox. I think it's important to remember too, we're in such early stages here. Most of the products that we're going to see in 10 years don't currently exist right now. Uh, Nouns DAO, for instance, is a great example of a DAO that's you know almost fully decentralized. Uh, still, they only have a few hundred members and the founders have uh, veto rights to avoid a 51% attack. Uh, the truth is most DAOs are neither decentralized nor autonomous. Uh, most of them don't even fall under the category of organization. Uh, so uh, everything is a work in progress right now. What's important for us is to set up a sustainable structure and a robust legal framework so that we can build over time and we can cater to the needs of the DAO and the community that's governing it. Yeah. I mean, if, if you just, yeah, if you look at it, like most of the DAOs have participation level, less than 1% of the uh, token holders actually end up voting on stuff. That's how early we are, right? So the control, the paradigm really needs to shift so that it becomes truly decentralized, truly all the community members are taking the, the uh, you know, an opportunity to kind of vote on proposals. But that also means what is building the right incentives, the economics around it, why they come back to, uh, looking into one particular community or a DAO, right? So all of these play a massive role uh, role in it. Um, so it's there's no silver bullet to all of this. It would also be, you know, ideal for DAOs to be um, uh, almost governed by like extrinsic motivation or intrinsic motivation rather than extrinsic motivation. Sure. That is people want to participate in the DAO because they want to build towards some common goal rather than for call it financial incentives or for status. But realistically in the Web3 space, NFT space, everyone's attention is segmented between dozens of different projects. People have personal commitments, people have jobs in and out of Web3. So the question is like, how do we really incentivize participation? How do we get people to care about the DAO? Um, and most of that is untested right now. Like you said, participation is usually around 1%. ENS sees 10 to 15% participation, but that is mostly a function of them having delegated votes on day one in order to claim your tokens. So again, everything is, is in very, very early stages now. And that's one of the beautiful things of getting to work in this space is that we are the ones who are pioneering all of the new changes. Yeah, and, and so is the community. I think there's amazing folks on this call on various different streaming platforms, right? Like Twitch and Twitter and everywhere else. Like we urge you guys to like think through things in a more holistic fashion, you know, while this is by no means a complete framework that you see in front, but these are the core components which we really need to dive deep into. And each of these are essentially communicating to each other and they don't operate in silos. Cause a lot of times we come back and teams are like, oh, we have our, smart contract and blockchain stuff figured out. Uh, we only need help with like a white paper in tokenomics or we have the legal stuff figured out, but we don't know how to do the DAOs and they're not independent. They're all very, very dependent on each other. You cannot have the right legal structuring without the right tokenomics. You cannot build a blockchain and smart contract without having your tokenomics and your legal uh, nuances in place. You, If you are an NFT project launching a, a, a fungible token, there's a con what you did on your NFTs, how those tokens were launched versus how your fungible token launched. And if there's an allocation or an airdrop mechanism, we need to know how they tie into each other. So, and same thing with institutional outreach, no one's necessarily gonna look into your project from an investment standpoint if you don't have the tokenomics or the incentive mechanisms in place. Same thing goes with DAO. So as you can see, they all are moving pieces, but very interconnected and in one from one with the other. So something to keep in mind as you uh, get some key takeaways from it, right? So what I wanna do next is for, at a very high level, um, give you some insights into what it took to actually launch the ApeCoin token. 
from a fungible token standpoint, as well as how the DAO is coming along? And what are some of the key things that goes into launching a successful project and some of the key learnings that we have had along the way? Not necessarily the slides, but I want to keep it conversational. And if folks on the call have any questions or comments around it, we'd love to take that on as well. But just looking quickly at you know the journey around how the uh, the timeline of for the ApeCoin launch itself. So just give you a, a, a you know filler context for those of you who are new to the space or who are just trying to figure out how to get their minds wrapped around it. So if you don't know, Boat Ape Yacht Club was probably the biggest success story as far as the NFT launches are concerned for 2021, and they continue to do so with additional uh, drops of NFTs, whether it be other side or anything else. Or, um, and it, it comprised of four co-founders who ended up launching the Boat Ape Yacht Club. Then they did Mutant Ape Yacht Club, and they brought in additional projects within the space like uh, Board Ape Kennel Club, and then the MeBits and the CryptoPunks and so forth, now becoming part of this entity called Yuga Labs. Um, so back in September, um, the team um, was considering to launch uh, a decentralized fungible token called ApeCoin, now known as ApeCoin. And the process uh, that we did was we kicked off the look to open launch project back in September. Now, if you look at the time frame, September to March, that's almost a six, five to six months uh, time frame with a lot of changes in the timelines, things that we wanted to do versus things we had to remove from the day one launch in itself. And keep in mind, this is the timeline for day one. As I said, this is just the beginning of your project, of your DAO uh, with the fungible token launch. So we kicked off the project. We had like a presenting a comprehensive sort of a timeline in terms of how long it will take. Typically for most of these fungible token launches, if done right, based on the previous slide, it will take anywhere from 16 to 20 weeks, right? And what it will do is you take care of what's the end game, right? What's the utility for, the, is there a platform, is there a DAO, how the community interacts and so forth. Then you come back to it, reverse engineer that, come back to day one, or, uh, or sorry, day zero, which is identifying, okay, fungible token. What are some of the other market comps that are in place? How do we compare against rest of them, if there are any? What are some of the uh, tokenomics we should be considering? Who are the participants within this space, right? And what I mean by participants, it's, um, your team members, uh, your, uh, you know, the company, are there any launch contributors? Are there any investors? Are there any special founder allocations that you want to be doing? From that point on, you figure out, okay, how many tokens these get allocated and how many tokens in, in total will be, uh, uh, you know, minting and how many tokens these get allocated based on the total uh, various allocations. From there, you think through, okay, how long um, do these get locked in for, right? What is the unlocking mechanism for this? Is there any vesting schedule attached to this, right? And, and, and why and why not, right? Then you have to think through what are the legal considerations for these unlock token unlocks? Because a lot of times outside looking in, you think like, oh, this person or this uh, company or this entity has been tied in for X, Y, Z period. Why, why not? But there's more to it than just random, like raising a finger and be like, oh, this should be locked for 12 months or 24 months. There are legal Im implications to things. There are considerations around what will actually create positive momentum uh, for the project. For example, you don't want your entire team dumping their token on day one. So we won't be comfortable doing that. Hence, we, uh, you know, say our projects, for example, not to do that either. And some of the team and the founders will be logged in for a longer time. So there's skin in the game. So once we do that, we get into the details of the launch. So in February, for instance, we started thinking through establishing the DAO. We did an outreach to the market makers, the exchanges, uh, coming up with a financing strategy that is bringing the right institutional partners uh, for the Yuga Labs teams, right? Um, identifying, coordinating the day one logistics. So if you think about once we have an agreement, what the token mechanics look like, how we do encode that into a smart contract, bringing in the auditors, then you get into the more operational heavy side of the house, which is 
how is this going to be communicated to the outside world? All of this while we've been thinking amongst, you know, Yuga Labs and Horizon Labs Ventures and the legal team at Benwick and the launch contributors that were part of it in our own little bubble. Now, when it comes to community, communicating to the world, how will they react to it? So we need to start talking to third parties like market makers. So we talk to all the big names like the wind commutes, the GSRs, the e-frontiers of the world, right? And exchanges, we had chats with Coinbase, with Kraken, with Binance, the OKXs of the world to get their value input. Like do the mechanics do look right? How do we go about communicating that? Can we orchestrate it such that the messaging goes out all at the same time? So this takes good six to eight weeks, coordinating everything right with all of these individual entities. And then that's where we start you know, start pulling for home runs. And that's when we <laughs> deliver uh, as a team at HLB, right? We make sure everything is, 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 uh, has a, has a structure to the madness. And, you know, and that's, that's our best value add, which is minimizing the execution risk for our partners. That's what it essentially comes down to. Because as I said, everything around it could be commoditized, will be commoditized. But the execution risk for these larger prayers that is very hard to master. And that's what we have been learning and honing and doubling down on, like how do we minimize that for our partners? And when it came to the March 17th launch, we know that this was the one of the biggest uh, you know, launches in the fungible token history. And that is very visible through the numbers as you would see, right? So we were able to do $8 billion valuation at the uh, time of launch. We had approximately 50 exchanges listing it all of your top exchanges going 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 for it, from your Coinbase to Binance, US, Gemini, Kraken, eToro, and everyone else. Um, and some of the failed ones, now that we have come to realize that probably uh, we didn't have much insight into uh, the operations, quite frankly, but yes, and there, there's always uh, one, one or two of those that, that exist too. But all in all, as you can see, one of the, many of the tweets like these that went out, the, every detail of the launch, that shows the level of execution, right? Which is by far the biggest value and you can give to your community and to your ecosystem when you're thinking about launching it, right? Um, because it's, that, that, that is what really the entire space is craving for is bringing the right operators, the right folks who can execute on the vision, the roadmap that you have laid out. And, you, you, and frankly, you cannot do it all alone. Because there's so many things you can do when you talk about token, talk about DAO, there's n number of things, but you need partners who can help you narrow those things down and help you achieve the level of success that it's hard to come by if you're just focusing it and doing it all by yourself. But I'll pause there, a lot to say, but I know Justin and Matt, you guys weren't here, but we'd love to hear your guys' view in terms of outside looking in, how we thought about it, uh, what were kind of your takeaways, uh, and then we'll get into the DAO aspects, which I believe you, you have a lot more uh, to talk about. Yeah, the one thing I'll say is that uh, Justin Rohan and I could launch an ERC-20 token in an hour. <laughs> uh, we can't launch an $8 billion token in an hour. These things take time. They take a lot of planning. And it's really, really important to think through all of the possible use cases of your token uh, before you actually end up launching it. Um, Justin, anything to add? No, I don't really have much to add there. I, I, I agree. I agree fully. Um, there's a big difference between uh, launching a professional token and just launching a token, um, yeah. just like an NFT project. It's the same. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and this goes in well into this question code by Jay King. I totally skipped over that part, which is by far the most critical aspect, right? Which is your smart contract development and making sure the code that you have is audited properly. So, you know, so, Typically, once you have your fungible tokenomics and all uh, the high level legal uh, entity structuring in place, you get into the smart contract development base, right? As you know, ApeCoin is an ERC20 token. So as far as the technology is concerned, a lot of it is fairly laid out, but you want to be careful around how you, you know, code in the mechanics around um, and the airdrops, like who gets more 
uh, like airdrop with this Basie or is it Macy or is Baxi? What is the components we are talking about? What is the math behind it? So that's what our tech team really delivered on as well, is kind of figuring out what is the right math uh, in order to support the uh, the economics behind the token itself. I'm forgetting what's the exact number of token drops, or if I believe it's like roughly 10% of the tokens were airdropped, but someone uh, feel free to correct me um, to, to the existing... It's, uh... 15 percent tokens that were airdropped yeah so there's an entire mathematical equation behind it how we came to a the percentage token drop and how different uh, you know nft holders will get those tokens airdropped as well so there's another method to madness there too and then once you go beyond that and have the smart contracts ready it's we are, we won't be comfortable auditing our own <laughs> smart contract i think that would be very uh that would be just wrong lately, right? So that's where, again, we work with our network partners. In this case, um, we leverage on our third-party service providers who are auditors like right? Halborn and Certic for the you know, top players as far as auditing smart contracts is concerned. Uh, so we work with them hand-in-hand hand to make sure all the bugs, everything that goes on uh, in terms of uh, before the go-live date is being checked. And we do this validation time and time again. There were over, so just to give you a hint, for white paper, we did eight iterations. From our us, we were the first pen to paper, um, then to legal, then to Yuga Labs team. And we did this eight times over before we were able to write that white paper that you see on the uh, on the website, right? The same thing goes with testing how the, the tokens are flowing from the smart contract to the exchanges, to the market makers. We do test runs and dry runs and making sure every single detail is in order. The same thing goes with the custody of those tokens as well, right? Each of those players within the ecosystem or the uh, the launch uh, party have custodianship, just making sure wherever the tokens go uh, to the custodians are checked before the token gets launched. So there's all of those operational heavy work has already been taken care of. And then right before the token launch, we coordinate with the PR and marketing team of both um, you know, uh, the, the launch party as well as the various exchanges and market makers. So all of those announcements that you saw and that go live on March 17 was not just coincident. It was orchestrated to happen in that manner. We had specific timelines by which each party should be tweeting about it or posting or writing a blog post and when certain aspects of the elements go live. So that's the intricate detail that really needs to go in. And that leaves everyone with that aha moment that we crave so badly in this space, right? So so that's that's kind of the backstory around ApeCoin launch. And this applies not just to that, but most of the launches that we tend to do. Yeah, it's like launching a rocket, right? It, it, it... On the ground, the rocket is just a metal tube with a bunch of fuel in it. Like anybody can take a metal tube, jam fuel in it, and light it, right? Um, you you October only get sky. one chance, <laughs> <laughs> right? You only get one chance to launch a, a token, and yeah. you know um, it's all about timing. Um, the timing of all of these pieces that come together are incredibly important. If you launch with one piece of that timing off, it could be not launching with the right market makers or the right marketplaces going. It could be. Um, not the right tokenomics. It could be bad contract code. Any single one of all of those pieces fails and you only get that one shot. So no matter who you partner with when you're building out your token or going to launch a token, and this goes for non-fungible tokens as well, um, make sure that whoever you partner with has the skill and talent of that strategic oversight that can time all those pieces to match perfectly together. It's much different than than other types of projects. So um, yeah, it's critically important. Um, so yeah, so that was like a quick summary on the, the token launch in itself, right? And now, as you know, and I would love to hear Justin and, 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 and Matt as well. By the way, Matt, who's also running for the uh, ApeCoin DAO Special Counsel, so shout out to him. Um, so I think DAO becomes a massive element of how these projects beyond the fungible token launch itself become successful. Um, you know, it's because it's at the end of the game, day, it's the community game, right? What the community believes in and what they really want to build. So knowing what you knew about the space and let's take maybe just the point out as an example, what are some of the elements that you would want to surface so folks here listening could get some insight, okay, how ApeCoin DAO is performing, say, compared to announced DAO or some of the other DAOs that exist and what's 
works, what doesn't work, um, and how does the token element itself, the fungible token element itself, kind of plays a critical role in 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 uh, making that a you know vibrant ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, listen, we we could talk about this for hours, right? I think. Uh... There are a lot of problems with the ApeCoin DAO, most of which come from the structure itself. So back to the point earlier that we were talking about, in order to fully realize the potential of a decentralized autonomous organization, you have to plan for years down the road. So one of the big problems with ApeCoin DAO, which we can talk about, is, is participation, right? So ENS gets 10 to 15% participation, Nouns DAO, something similar, ApeCoin is like a fraction of a percent, right? So you're going to see two or three million total votes out of the, you know, whatever hundred million of circulating circulating supply uh, that we have. So why is participation important? Well, first, community representation is kind of the only thing that matters when it comes to decentralized organizations, right? Or else we're just running a centralized institution here. Okay. Uh, one of the really awesome things that ENS included, which ApeCoin DAO has, but hasn't been utilized correctly, is the idea of delegation. So giving your votes, you know, say I have uh, 100,000 ApeCoin and then delegating them to Justin. So then every time he votes, my votes also count along with his. Uh, so theoretically, if you are delegating your votes to someone whose um, policies and values align with yours, then we can employ this idea of community representation, right? Even if I'm not participating, my ideas are coming to the surface. Uh, other than that, in terms of participation, like, again, it's quite untested, but there are a number of incentive mechanisms you can include to increase participation. You have social incentives, so things like on-chain badges, for instance, or financial incentives, either through gift tokens or bounties, or simply allocating a small percentage of the treasury to people who are active in discourse or on snapshot. So there are a number of things that we can explore which aren't exactly tested in other DAOs, but people are starting to think through these. Uh, one of the uh, platforms that I really like is Coordinate, if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, it's this idea of gift tokens where uh, everyone is allocated a certain number of gift tokens. If you retain them for yourself, they have no value. But if you gift them to other people in the community, they can then exchange those for some governance token, which has uh, you know, a, a fiat denominated value. Uh, what that does is it lets you reward people in the community who you think have contributed a lot. Uh, it adds to this idea of community where people start to really interact with each other. And um, again, that's just like one of the thousands and thousands of platforms I think we're going to start to see uh, take an effect in DAOs. Uh, so if we think very high level, you know, you have structure and then within structure, you have actual operations, you have participation, you have uh, hedging strategies or strategic token swaps. And then below the structure in itself is what is the DAO trying to achieve, right? But you're only going to be able to figure out what the DAO is trying to achieve and realize its full potential if you start from the top down and, and fix structure. Very well put. Justin, do you agree with that? I see you smiling, so I'm, I'm guessing that's 100% on par with what the what line just said. Yeah, I think to a point. I think yeah. my my personal take on DAOs is I think that as they evolve, we'll we'll start to find more of like a represent re representative type of democracy will will prevail. Um, I think participation is a big issue, but I think part of the reason for that participation in other large DAOs when we've done you know studies and, and surveys is um, kind of voter fatigue, right? Most of us have jobs. We have we participate in more than one project going in and having to read these very long proposals, get situational awareness of what's going on, um, you know, and and feel like we're intelligent enough to actually vote. It's actually a, a phenomena that um, isn't talked about a lot, but a lot of participants in DAOs don't feel like they might look at the votes, but they don't feel like they're actually have the right knowledge uh, or situational awareness to vote on what's being proposed. Um, so I think that we'll, as we evolve, we'll see more uh, DAOs where the majority of voting is just voting on representatives 
whether that's like a bicameral type of setup or whether that's elect, uh, electing um, you know, leaders to, to run certain aspects for a, for a period of time and sort of giving them a mandate and a power for what they can do. Um, I think we'll see more of that and that could uh, reduce or increase participation and kind of reduce that fatigue where maybe only super important things have to go from the elected representatives to a full, a full DAO vote. Um, yeah. I think we're seeing more experimenting with that now. And, and that's uh, one thing I think can be done. I also think um, the user experience of participating could be a lot better. Right. <laughs> I'm a product yeah. guy and like, it's, it's ugly now, right? Like, it's like, you start in Discord, you learn about something, you go to Snapshot to vote, but then there's a link in Snapshot that goes to Discourse and you go through scrolling through Discourse trying to figure out what's going on. And then you go back to Snapshot and you have to get your hardware wallet and sign. And it's just, uh, you know, it's a long, uh, it's a long process. Um, you know, I'd love Sorry, to see I'm as we get into that. things like, um, you know, uh, I think, um, you know, other side could be a great example, which is, you know, very tied very closely to ApeCoin you know, where people, maybe they'll build a vote inside the other side. Like if they have ApeCoin and it comes in, it's like, oh, this person hasn't voted for this yet. It's like, hey, do you think X, Y, Z? Oh yeah, sure, I think so. And and kind of putting that in front of them and giving it to them in a way they can digest and be as, as user-friendly as a Twitter poll and not a, mm-hmm. not a complex well, long process. But All of it sounds so simple, uh, all you just <laughs> it's described. So simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's so simple. Um, no, I think, but you get the message across, right? Because this is very nebulous. Uh, area that is starting to come to life. There's both business challenges, there's both legal and regulatory challenges that come with it, right? A lot of these DAOs typically tend are are structured offshore, right? How this evolves, how, for instance, the US thinks about bringing some of these DAOs and structure in-house will will impact who can participate, why they can participate, etc. So we're, we're learning. And I think part of us being in this space and kind of seeing this firsthand working with these projects, looking, going deep into the weeds around these uh, conversations with both, you know, legal entities and the projects and how they're thinking about it provides us that um, upper hand to see how, how we can build this future around DAO, around new fungible tokens and the new uh, business models that, that will be different than what we saw in sort of the V1 uh, of, of the NFT and the fungible token rush. Yeah, DAO fatigue is a great point, right? Yeah. Like, it's already hard enough to get voters in the U.S. to show up at the midterm elections and then the general <laughs> elections. Uh, the, do we really expect the average retail investor to be participating, you know, every single week in the ApeCoin DAO? And that's, yeah. you know, one thing a lot of holders have told me is maybe we should decrease the uh, frequency of voting from every single Wednesday to the first Wednesday of every month, or even biannually. This way we get the highest quality proposals every time to vote. Uh, and then people also don't get tired. Uh, and uh, it, every, everything in this space is communicated more or less on Twitter. So the more we can keep it you know, uh, consolidated to a few times a year where we actually have to vote. And that, of course, has drawbacks, but the, the easier it'll be. 100%. Yeah, I guess we got our own Twitter. Uh, I'll talk to Elon there. Um, <laughs> um, but I know we have eight minutes and these conversations, as, as you can see, we've only touched, what, nine slides barely. And there's so many components we can touch on and talk about. But I do want to get into... Uh, some of the detail kind of get a feel look and feel for like what goes into some of these token launches beyond just us talking and telling you right so these are just examples of um, what are some of the comp analysis that we do in the back end right um have like 20 plus projects we analyze uh in the space and and mind you when we're doing apecoin there weren't very many, you know, similar projects that were in space. It was something unique, something different. Um, and that's what created all the buzz to go along with it as well. They, nothing take, Taking nothing away from the community and the founders and how beautifully they've been able to, uh, you know, create a narrative around, and a story around what they're doing. It's, it's just unbelievable. But there is a lot of work that goes behind that storytelling too. Um, so, so this is like the analysis that we do, right? So, same thing goes with the NFT 
T comps. It's all been, we need to understand the market uh, insights, what's the best practices around token allocations, pricing, and how this, uh, uh, you know, the space itself evolves over a period, it becomes very critical. And this is just like an illustrative token flow model, right? Um, not tying it to any of the projects that we're working on, but this is, um, this is kind of the level of detail. I, I don't know if you guys can clearly see the words that are being mentioned here, but what this does is allows you to create a more holistic mechanics around the token flow, right? So one aspect of it is, this, is, is just the tokens itself, how many, the numbers, the allocation. The other is how do you, dis, what, what is the mechanics? Where's the tokens gonna to be used? how the different participants are going to be incentivized, how the users, on the other hand, is able to participate in this economy. So it's, think of it as almost like a platform and you have a supply side, you have a demand side, and you're creating the right mechanics and incentives for both parties so that it becomes a viable ecosystem, right? Um, so that's what's mo very beautiful about uh, doing all of this because there's a lot of creative juices that go into it. You, you can literally design, you know, you have a blank canvas and you can design anything and everything you want. Um, but what will you notice if you're doing it the right way, this token design really goes hand in hand with your technical architecture. So as again said, like that becomes a very critical element of what ends up designing. All of this, you can do it in silo and come up with the most creative solution. But then there is, as you realize, there is technical feasibility is a major component in what you can and cannot do, right? What will become a bottleneck and what will help you actually do things the right way. So we typically start off with as expansive of a model as possible. And then we slowly but steadily filter down what is the most lovable product as Justin uh, likes to say, or the minimum lovable uh, product design that Justin likes to say, is to create it and find the right feature set so that we can create the token design for that. But knowing that there are additional components we can add in future, but we have sort of this minimum uh, product in place, the token flows beautifully, we have the right token incentives, we have the right token uh, sponsors from the buyer side, from the seller side, and there's a holistic ecosystem that's in making uh, that gets designed. And last but not the least, just a quick view of this token allocation model. Again, you know, the, these are the components, these are kind of the deliverables that we think about it day in, day out. We, we love doing that. We love to, you know, break pieces and build them all together all over again. We have done this several times with a lot of different projects. A lot of, most of them have not even been publicly announced, but we are looking at it on a daily basis from a few different lenses. As you could imagine, our first one was ApeCoin, then we worked with a health tech startup with gaming startups, we're looking at metaverses and all of them, they have their own unique dynamics and we're able to you know, infer information around how to design these token tokenomics and the uh, technical aspects uh, from a lot of different angles, right? Some are more complicated than the others. The simpler ones have a shorter you know, time to market. The other ones, we have to do a little more nuanced approach of uh, how do you think about the tokens, the numbers, uh, who are the people that needs to be involved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and last but not least, quickly touching on proposal and guidance. As again, for ApeCoin, we did uh, you know, help with the um, AIP-1, which was helping carve out the structure and how the AIP should be uh, written. And we do that with um, all, most of all of our partners who are looking to create a DAO or want to participate in a DAO. Um, we help write the proposals as well on behalf of our partners too, if they want to participate, because by now we have um, sort of a, uh, a playbook that, uh, that we understand, like what makes sense in terms of the right business model, what's the ask should be, et cetera. So we're more than happy to work with any and all of the projects if you guys are looking to do something within the DAO space or working with proposals. But that's kind of our core, one of the core suite of services that we help as well. So again, seeing that end-to-end -end is what we enjoy a lot. Um, and I think that's where a lot of benefit uh, comes to, to whoever ends up you know, talking to us or even when we don't know something, we point you to folks who do. So, you know, that's that's the power of the network. That's the power of working in such an open, decentralized manner and we love it. Um, that's all I have from a slide perspective. I know that gift leaves us with two minutes. I don't know, Justin, uh, Matt, if you guys had anything to add to it. Uh, I know um, 
I just want to make a quick comment before we end this as well, but curious to hear if you had any other thoughts. I think that's it for me. Uh, you did a good comprehensive job of explaining the process. Uh, anyone that has any questions, feel free to DM me on Twitter or uh, Rohan and Justin too. Uh, we, we love talking about this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We could spend all day talking about it. Um, it's super exciting. There's, uh, there's so much cool stuff going on in the space and so many projects coming up. Um, and we're fortunate enough to work with a lot of them and we look forward to working with more. All the builders out there that are listening, uh, reach out to us. Uh, even if we can't help, we can more than often than not point you in, in the right direction of who can, so. Yeah, and shout out to Magic Eden team who are putting this all together and having us on this call as well. We love the team, what they're doing and what they stand for. I think they're really pushing the Web3 ethos and the ecosystem forward. And uh, yeah, if, if not us, they, they are the right partners to do some you know, thought processing as well, like brainstorming. I think they add tremendous value to the entire ecosystem. Um, and just for all the uh, Magic DAO members who are listening around this call, um, the phrase to earn your Magic points is Dawn which is D-A-W-N, Don. Um, so whoever needs to listen to that, um, I've uh, part of that information. Really appreciate your guys' time. And uh, again, thank you, uh, Magic Eden folks. Great chatting with you all.